All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And a warm welcome to all of you to the Better Business, Better Society seminar today. My name is Jonna Söderholm, and I'm heading the External Relations Unit here at the School of Business. So it is our pleasure, our team's pleasure, together with our comms team, to organize these seminars. Um, before I let the real stars of the event on stage, I'd like to say a few words about what's happening here at the School of Business. As I presume most of you are School of Business alumni. Actually, let's take a show of hands just to understand who's in the audience today. So how many or who is actually a School of Business graduate, either from the Helsinki School of Economics time or from the Aalto University School of Business or School of Economics? Wow, okay. Grand majority. Welcome to you all, but also, of course, welcome to all of our invited guests as well. All right, um, so what's happening? What's up at the School of Business? If you participated in the, the previous, let's say, couple uh, seminars, you will know that we have a new sheriff in town. So we have a new dean, Timo Korkeamäki. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. He's traveling. Uh, but we were really lucky to snatch him from Hanken. So we have our new dean. And what's on our new dean's plate, especially at this time, is, I'd say, two major development programs. One is the strategy for the School of Business. So what we have now is a brand new uh, strategy for, for the whole of the Aalto University. And now what we need to do at the schools is actually well, you know, figure out what it means for us here. So what we should do in terms of research, teaching, and societal impact. So that's one. The other thing that's uh, going on as we speak is what we call the teaching evaluation. So again, an Alto University level initiative, but at the School of Business, we're also going through all of our teaching programs in terms of content and uh, learning methods and so forth. And obviously then checking out what we can do better, where we can develop and, and what we should do then again going forward. So that's what's, that's what's happening really here at the School of Business right now. Now, since um, the External Relations Unit is, is responsible for the alumni activities, I just have to use this occasion also to do a little bit of pre-marketing. Let's put it that way. So, um, actually, who has already received today, this afternoon, the alumni newsletter that we sent out by, by email? Wow! Who's actually read it today? <laughs> wow! All right. Who noticed a thing called the homecoming day? Okay, you were attentive. Okay, th this is, you know, <laughs> okay, you already know what we're talking about. But basically, I, what I'm doing right now is I'm doing a, a um, save the date invitation live. So, save the date, the 28th of August, uh, we're going to have uh, our event, which is organized every two years, a major event. Uh, actually, the largest alumni event that we have. Um, not just the afternoon, it's the afternoon, it's the evening. And for the partiers, it's the whole night. So, so do check, you know, do um, uh, now, now book that in your calendars. There will be obviously more information coming. Um, I think the ticket sales will start April ish. April ish, okay, so stay in tune. Um, the theme of this year's event is managing disruption. And our keynote speaker will be the uh, CEO or the president and CEO of UPM, Jussi Pesonen. So, and obviously we're going to have a load of other great, great uh, talkers or I mean uh, speakers there as well. And uh, so, yeah, so, the <laughs> so there's the, the main seminar, there's parallel seminars, there's a buffet dinner, there's dance, uh, a live band and so forth. But stay tuned. All right, enough marketing for that. Now let's come back to today and this day's seminar. So it is now my pleasure to invite our very own, our great um, di or research director, Herta Vorema on stage, and then she will invite our great panelists after her opening words. So welcome once again and welcome on stage, Herta. Thank you. Thank you. That was very official. Um, hi, good evening, I guess, to everyone. Uh, that, yeah, that was very official. That's a, oh, I feel like a sort of like expected official talk now. I, I'd like to sort of 
tone it down a notch or two. This is not going to be that official. I'm hoping this would be very discussive. I have great panelists here. I know they all have a lot to say. I'm just going to say a few words about what is it that we're going to be talking about here. But just to repeat, my name is Hept Warama. I lead a research project here at Dalto University School of Business. And what we really focus on is that looking at how work is changing, how technology is changing, work, organizations, leadership in different ways. Uh, it's a topic that's very important to me in many ways, and I'm always happy to talk about it. So I'm going to really have to be mindful here that we start the panel at quarter past. But I still decided that I'm not going to show you any slides because this is not a lecture. By the way, this is not very corona friendly, this mic. I have to touch it with my mouth all the time. So let's hope you don't have any. Um, <laughs> so I feel like a, you know, like a travel guide here, but I am kind of a travel guide. They take us on a little journey on a while, and uh, before that, I'll say a few words about the background. So what we do research on, uh, together with Christina Makela, who is in the audience, so I have to be mindful with my facts. Tina can tell me that, no, no, that's not what we found, but no, we're looking at change, and we know that this is not a new thing. You all know that this is not a new thing, right? Work has always been changing. If we look at industrial revolutions, they will follow another, and we always get new tools, a new kind of machinery. Second industrial revolution has given us the management thinking, largely as we know it today, sadly, in some ways. We should be evolving from that, and that's one of the things we're talking about today. What we also know is that work is such an institution that it's very slow and hard to change. It evokes a lot of emotion in people. When you start talking about shortening the working days or the working weeks, people have a lot of worries. What's going to happen to our national economy and so forth? Same time, we also know that work's hard to measure, particularly when we talk about white-collar expert work. Is it really all about effectivity, and if so, how? The institution nature of work means that it cuts to everybody's core identity. Particularly in Finland, in Finnish context, if you ask people something about themselves, they usually immediately tell you what they do for work. But work's also something that connects you to the surrounding society. And if you don't have that connection, researchers find that you lack identity and meaning in your life. Something that's far more worrying for researchers these days in terms of the future than losing the actual income. If you ask robotic scientists, they all support the national income because they say that that's what's going to happen. What they're worried about is how are these people going to have a meaning, purpose, identity? What's that going to be built on? However, it's not something that we should be looking at from the utopic, dystopic perspectives because the reality is probably going to be somewhere in between. A question of how well we and this goes now to all of us, every single one of us can adapt to the change. How well are we going to think this through as societies, as organizations, as, as every individual? This is a call that's set out by the World Economic Forum in not very, how would I say, discursive terms. They're quite clear that if we don't realize that the future of work really was yesterday or the day before, and if we don't stop talking about the future, instead start thinking about right now, and if we don't realize that this is work that needs to happen simultaneously, individual, organization, and societal level, that's when we're going to land with uh, dystopia. Or maybe utopia, who knows. But the reality is that we should be working on this, and it's head work. It's thinking work, it's analysis that we need to be working on, and we should be doing it together. Which is why it's great to have events like this, because, you know, this is like a chance to think together. First, we think a little bit, the four of us, and then you get to ask questions, and hopefully everybody goes away with a lot of new thoughts and ways of thinking about this. So, without any further ado, can I invite the honorable panelists over? And... Um, you can, you're free to pick your seats. I think I let you all introduce yourselves because people always do that better themselves. So, you know, sit wherever you want. And uh, maybe we start with Katya. The mic business is this corona business, so <laughs> you need to put it like this to your chin so people can hear. And this is great because no one can really interrupt. You can't interrupt unless you have a really loud voice, so you need to wait for your turn. But Katya, do you want to start maybe and sort of say a few words about yourself? And then Juha, and then Saku, and then we start with the first question. 
Yeah, hey, nice to be here. My name is Katja Toropainen. I actually started studying at Aalto University School of Business in 2012. Later on went to be part of the leadership team at Slush during the past years. During those years, I followed the global startup and technology industry, spent a lot of time across in, in the US and in Europe. And then uh, a year ago, I st uh, founded an, a nonprofit called Inclusive that advances diversity and inclusion in working life. And based on what I've seen abroad, what kind of studies and data points there are, and how big topic diversity and inclusion in working life is, we still have a lot to do everywhere in the world, but also in, in working life here in Finland. And we're building a community uh, that brings together individuals, uh, corporations, organizations to share knowledge about best practices around this, these topics. And we have already plenty of uh, companies on board. In addition to this, we host trainings and do consulting about these topics. And we haven't yet publicly launched, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this any, 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 any way. So I'm building, building this organization. Okay, hello. Could, is it this afternoon still, I think, or evening? You said evening. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Good to be here. See you all here. So my, my name is Juha Akras, and I'm here, I think, mainst, mainly because I'm really excited about leadership and also what is really this future work, because I think that this dystopian view of the work is quite prominent at the moment. People feel that, okay, everyone is just losing their jobs, and I don't think that's the case, and let's discuss about it. My background is that I was, uh, I'm also Alta, Alta alumni, but on the, on the other building there, actually, then it was not there, but, but here anyway. And now I've been working here at Alta as executive in residence. We have our research program, this exponential, I guess we are a bit going to talk about it. Tina is also heading that program, and Rilana is my colleague in the program. There we are focusing on that how this work is really changing on organizational level and individual level. I'm also co-founder um, and now chairman of the board of Hinsa Performance. There we are thinking about, okay, what is the whole individual well-being and but also organizational well-being where we are touching the same topics. My background is then long-term Nokian. So I hope you don't ask me anything about Nokia today because everyone has and I don't know anything about it. You need to go and discuss maybe with Christian <laughs> if you want to do that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Saku Tuominen. Good evening for all of you. Um, short introduction of myself. I tr I've been doing many things, but I try to concentrate on the areas which might have some relevance regarding the discussions today. So I founded my first company in 1989, which, which was a TV production company. We sold it twice to Sweden to different owners. Uh, then I was running a creative department of a global TV production company, and I was running teams in 17 countries, 34 companies uh, in total. And, and it was a I interesting lab on how to manage creativity across borders, across time, time zones, and so on. Not simple at all. Uh, then we founded a company called 9 to 5, which was exam examining the future of office work. And actually, I got tired of TV, and then I got tired of the future of office work. So th this is just it's something... It's good that you're here that, now. <laughs> exactly, and then we sold it to Juha and, and so on. So I, I love the theme, but I'm not extremely excited about adults complaining about obvious things and, 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 and so on. And, and for the past years, I've been mostly concentrating on education. So we are. I'm running a global education non-profit and our goal is to identify the leading the, the best possible education innovations across borders and help them spread and then we are operating in all continents and try to identify for example what is the best way to teach thinking skills or mindset in in kindergarten for example and that's that's exciting and as a hobby we are running a couple of restaurants Savoy Palace and, and Espa but that's another story and so on so kind of like Great to be here because I don't have to be working with these problems anymore. So this is a nostalgic panel for me. 
Thank you, everyone. As you can see, we have a very good expert panel here. Make sure you're thinking of tricky questions to ask them in the end. You have 15 minutes of questions from quarter past six. But hey, let's get going with our topics. Um, I kind of warned you about what I'm maybe wanting you to talk about. And I had this lovely task, and I'm sure you loved it, when I asked you to bring an artifact that to you symbolizes the future of work, the changing natures of work, nature of work. So who wants to start? Who wants to introduce their object first and give the sort of explanation of why that and maybe simultaneously your own kind of view into what it means what is changing work for you so i i have the boring one this is it so this is my office in the pocket i kind of wanted it to be easy for you yeah, I saw yeah so this was too obvious for me but actually i'm not when i when we, we were at nokia and, and we were actually in inventing this whole thing, we were really excited about it. And now I think that maybe we invented something which is not that good either. There's kind of also the negative side because it's very addictive. And, and we know that many applications, they are designed to addict you. And, and in the end of the day, what is good then for the individuals and, and as well as for the society, there's kind of, as maybe with everything, there's good and bad with that. I'm going to be even more boring one uh, because when, when, when you get a task like this, you want to come up with something innovative or something creative or something out of the box. But the fact is that for me, it comes down to laptop, laptop and, and mobility because we have the possibility to work, as we all know, in various places. We have the Zooms, we have the Skypes and, and so on. So for me, that's kind of like the essence, more than mobile. Mobile is the laptop. Okay, I have something more, more creative. <laughs> than Yay! Than the younger <laughs> generations, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Kidding, both of these were good. <laughs> so, uh, I brought a magazine that has a picture. This is a great, great picture. Uh, nothing about this one, but uh, I want you to think about representation Role, model, role models and stereotypes. So if I'm talking about a CEO or a coder, how many of you are thinking of a woman? Raise your hands. Only few, a couple. <laughs> and how many of you are thinking of a man? Most of the people. Uh, so something that matters is representation, what kind of people we see in, in what kind of roles. And also, for example, in technology, we have a devastating lack of women and our other minorities. And uh, published at Harvard Business Review, there's a study that showed that, for example, girls performed much better in science when their textbooks included uh, pictures of women scientists. So I think we need much more representation uh, in the business world, in society at large, and diversity and inclusion are uh, topics that advance those. Yeah, and I think it's more than that. I think that looking ahead in terms of the societal changes that we're witnessing is something that we cannot avoid. We have to think about sustainable. Sustainable means everybody needs to be on board, not just the selected few, the few white, you know, middle-aged men. Not to guilt trip anyone, but that has been the situation for a long time. But thank you. I think those were great sum-ups of how this is how work has changed. It's become more easy to do from wherever, whenever, and that is part of the sort of leading it managing a challenge as well because it's like I guess in full, if I look at our data that's collected amongst the 50 biggest companies in Finland what everybody's talking about is different kinds of leadership and management challenges that really come down to the fact that how do I manage and lead a, a group of experts for instance who are never at the same time in the same place and in a sort of best case scenario not even in an employment relationship to me so what is my position as a leader there how am I going to get them to do what I want them to do this is an actual question posed to me by a very senior experienced leader so that takes me to my next question to you so if you look at your own careers and you you've all done many things even though some of you are younger than others then how has this changed how have you witnessed can you sort of pinpoint how changing work changing leadership changing management whichever angle you want to take has been visible in your own work in whatever order you want to go Katya has the mic so maybe you want to go and I'll give this to you so 
Yeah, something that I've been seeing during the past years, uh, very visibly during my years at Slush as well, is the rise of, of purpose and, and mission-driven work. In 2017, when we were deciding the main theme for Slush, we wanted to switch it a lot and we change it to how, how entrepreneurs are solving one of the biggest problems in the world. And it has really been exciting to see how sustainability has during the past year also become so much more important and become part of the core business strategies in, in more and more, more companies. So I would say that uh, purpose and, and mission-driven work are, are on the rise. And where we're talking about sustainability, it's not only about environment, uh, but it's also social matters. And under that comes topics like diversity and inclusivity, uh, how great work are, uh, how, how much fun do we have at work and how are we, we treated there. So I'm really excited about more inclusive uh, future, future of work. I might have bad news about that one because in our data we actually we are also collecting it's not the same study but we are collecting uh, data from 50 companies on very detailed level and we are using validated measures and we have also responsibility measures and we are asking that how employees see that whether their companies are responsible and actually it's very neutral so in, in if you have a great company and they have actually they measure really well in leadership and climate and, and, and ways of working and people are excited, actually on an average on responsibility side, they are still seeing that our company is not doing kind of in a great way. So we have companies like who has great reputation in this area and they are a bit ahead, but we are not scoring fives if that would be the maximum. Um, in, in, in those, so I think we have room to play, but we can also see the clearly that the younger generation, what they want in the data also, that actually this meaningfulness is really key, this purpose, that they can see that there's, in, there's a meaning in my work and, and, and there's a purpose involved, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking that way as well. If I look my career, which is maybe a bit longer than yours, because I have perspective that we didn't have mobile phones and laptops when I started. We hardly had a PC when I started work. Actually, that we just got at that time. I think the difference is that if you have coronavirus, if you would have had that at that time, when we traveled all the time, I mean, communication was all the time face to face. So it meant that we would not work. So, and now we just say that, okay, now everyone stays at home and you participate via teleconferences and we just continue to work. The other big, Big change is that actually then when we discussed about the team, you had your own team. You were participating one team normally. Nowadays, hey, how many teams we all are working with? I mean, we all the time changing teams. We said that you actually in team development, first you have forming and then you have storming and then you have norming. You all remember these kind of curves. We thought that it will take one year and then the team can be kind of start to work. And then after a couple of years, they are really the most effective teams. Now that we all the time changing the teams. So that's, from my point of view, a really big change today. Uh, if, if you would have been asking the question from me five years ago, I would have probably said that the change is massive. But, but since you're asking the question today, I'm saying is that it's extremely small. So if I'm kind of like thinking my working life from 1980s till today, I would say that practically nothing relevant has changed. The leadership and, and so on is, is almost the same. Uh, I've been always working in a work environment where meaning and, and doing meaningful work has been kind of like obvious. And we've, all, all, we've been also having diversity from day one and, and so on. We haven't been having global diversity, but, but otherwise we've been really strict on that one and, and, as, as well. So, and then, I'm working a lot with education and, and we tend to see the chains as black and white. We, we were working at cubicles, then we were working at kind of like saying that cubicles don't work and then it was open workspaces and then we come up with uh, kind of like understandings that actually that's not good either and maybe 
the reality is somewhere in between. And that's exactly what is happening in education at the moment. Classrooms, not perfect for many of the kids. Open learning spaces, not great either. And maybe, maybe it's somewhere in between. And, and, and if I'm thinking about the future of work, I'd say that the same is, is that should we all be stuck in the office? Definitely not. Should we all be working remotely all over the world? Not optimal either. And it's kind of like somewhere in between. So if I would be trying to identify one thing that is probably the most crucial change, I would say is that it's holistic well-being. Because there's so much stress, there's so much anxiety, there's so much working across time zones and so on and so on. I'd say that if people want to be thinking clearly, if they want to be creative, if they want to be effective, they have to be living a kind of like good life, meaning is that they are healthy, they have a me sense of meaning and so on. And that's kind of like a new I dimension in the discussion of work in each and every work environment I'm, talk I, I'm, I'm involved in. Thank you. And Katja wants to comment on that. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's a gap between our generations as, as well, because, uh, and I would challenge your thoughts. I can't see you, so I'm going to come, <laughs> but now, I'm sorry, I'm kind of turning my back on you guys. Maybe, can, can, can you go back a little bit? Just to, if Saku goes back a little bit, and like that, can, now I can see you all and everybody can see us, yeah? 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 And hear us, right? Okay? Yeah, yeah so sorry. Maybe I would challenge, challenge you, you both a bit because what's been like what for example I've been following for the past years has been the, the, the global startup and tech tech industry and there's a lot of interesting trends like like impact investing, much more mission driven startups. So maybe that's still something something small, but maybe what I see in in my bubble and in what kind of topics for example entrepreneurs uh, decide decide to want to solve are are much more much much more more mission driven and people are talking about these topics a lot more but i agree with you that there's so much talk but then still the change in the business world and in the society is just devastatingly slow yeah, yes and no i mean i don't disagree with you strongly but for example if i'm thinking about my work life uh, work life We've been doing doing charity work from day one. We've been devoting like 20% of the work we do into a pro bono project and so on. And practically everyone in our industry have been doing the same. Now we are having more tools to do that one and it's more common in society and so on. But from my personal view, the change has not been massive in my own personal working life. But I think that you're touching on something very important here, because that's something that's actually very visible in our research as well, which is this um, um, summoned well by one of our interviewees who said that, like, and he was now talking about tech purely, he said that, you know, technologically speaking, we, can, we have a Porsche here, but we drive it like a bike. And why we do that is because it's, it, he talks about mindset and what we talk about in our research group is mindset, that's a mindset issue. And this is a sort of thing, I have not heard, first of all, a good Finnish word for that. So if someone can think of a good Finnish word for mindset, please be in touch. This is, I've been saying this to everyone. I, I can't find, it needs to be active and internal at the same time, very hard. But anyway, um, that's what in our data and you know companies that we work with, everybody comes down to this. It's like it's about how you think about work. It's and I think that the types of companies Katya is talking about, that's it's not an issue there. It started in a certain way. It's like much easier. You've started five guys coding, five girls coding, whatever, with a certain kind of mindset. But turning a big ship around is what everyone's thinking about, how to do that, or do you need to? So let's get to the sort of hard deep waters and like do you have views concrete suggestions of how do we turn our mindsets in terms of work how do we sort of and i want you to think now in terms of individual organizational societal because we need to do that in all levels we need to rethink work and we need to rethink leadership and management and how do we do that small little question <laughs> Thanks. You are, you are <laughs> uh, 
well, that's probably the most difficult question there is at the moment, especially if you are thinking about education, K-12, kindergarten, primary, secondary, meaning how do you really make it happen? And, and most of the studies on that area kind of like show is that we are slightly overthinking and underdoing. So we are, we are talking about lifelong learning, we are not talking about lifelong doing. How do you keep the capacity to operate if the, if the future is uncertain? And, and, and you were, when you were explaining the dilemma, you were always thinking, how, how should we change the thinking? And, and I, I think that we, we should have kind of like agile way of working, operating, testing, trying, and, and that should start early on early on, and I think that that should be the massive change in education globally, is that we are learning by doing, and many teachers say that that's exactly what is happening. I would challenge that one, it is that there are exceptions, but that's not the way we are teaching our kids and so on. So I'm not anti-thinking, but what I'm saying is that doing is an extremely effective way to think. Yeah, the mindsets, they are really difficult. And if you think about that, that's basically, we know that facts basically give us direction, but emotions make us act. Yeah. And, 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 and this emotional side, this whole attitude, mindset, whatever, is everyone is talking about, yes, lifelong learning, but really, for instance, in our data, there are a couple of things what we can see. One is that one, that, that mindset of actually well-being, what Sakori said, it's quite interesting because there is, we can measure what is your well-being orientation. And, and you could think that, okay, it's good that you have well-being orientation because then you're taking care of yourself, you're going to exercise a bit more, you have more energy, you have more capacity, you most probably are more innovative. But actually we see correlations that, that well-being orientation correlates really nicely with actually all the good stuff. I recovery experiences, actually if you are working long hours, actually if you have well-being orientation, you, your recovery, mental recovery experience is actually a lot higher. If you think about meaningfulness, for instance, there's clear correlation that those people who have well-being orientation, they also feel meaning, meaning in their life. And, and so we can see that there are these kind of mediators, kind of mindset mediators, that what really makes you kind of, what makes the difference. The other one is actually responsible mindset. Think about, if you think about your company or we think about slash organization or any startup more or less, people are really excited in the beginning. I mean, they have all the motivation what they need. And, 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 and they, you can have totally self-managed teams because people are, they know what they're doing, at least they are very inspired, and, and they have motivation to do it. Then 10 years goes, and, and then 20 years goes, and now we are a growth company where the same people are doing about the same thing, some of them. 20 years has passed, and then we start to figure out why on earth our people are not anymore as self-managed. And, and, and actually, it comes back to mindset and motivation, because you might lose your motivation in the way, and you can't be self-managed if you don't have high motivation, if you don't have high competence, if you are not able to manage yourself. You can't self-regulate if you are not able to, if you don't have that skill. So, so those kind of mindsets are also, and then collective mindset. I mean, really interesting thing is that we are so individualistic culture and society. At the same time, we see that for innovation, you need to have actually collective work. And, and if you look at our HR practices, they are very individualistic. And, and if you think now that what is the future, if it's more collective, how on earth we are going to change our mindsets that we would be more collective in our mindsets? That is, I think, what we need. I was actually thinking a bit about the, the same topic, how, how difficult the change in mindsets in is if you're part of a company culture, company that has been like, uh, like alive for tens of years or so forth because the, the cultures are already there and has, has been building for, for such a long time compared to starting something completely new. And there's an interesting uh, term uh, called cultural debt uh, nowadays also uh, because early on when you when you start start a company or something there's a lot of de uh, decisions you you make and those are some key decisions that are taking you somewhere but if you're try trying to change the mindset or the culture of the company that has been alive for I don't know 30 50 years 
how much resources is that going to take? I, I guess a ton. Actually, McKinsey has great databases about it, and, and, and it looks that maybe there's one McKinsey kind of alumni or, or member here, so you can then correct me. But what I saw then at Nokia time, because we were doing a transformation program, and, we, and McKinsey kindly advised us that how long it will take. And based on their studies, first of all, half of them, of course, fail. Kind of nice starting point. And, and, but those who really were successful, it took four years. And it's actually not the whole culture, but there were certain elements like that they became customer oriented, as an example. So if you start to change already existing, if it's mindset or culture, it takes a long, long time. And, and you need to make it very clear for people that what it means, because of course, we don't know what we don't know. We are, our perceptions are reality. And, and if, we don't, if we are not able to build a I think where Saku is great, that you are able to build vision about the future, kind of make it very concrete, and hey, there's something great to aspire to. I've seen for instance, companies um, who are now kind of, in, especially in this future of work, I think great examples that same industry, both companies have the same idea about that, hey, we need to kind of, what, what is the opportunity of automation? And both companies have the same idea that actually we have to automate, we need to be more competitive in the future. Two totally different spirits in the company. So the other one is kind of excited because we are changing for good and, and there's some exciting opportunities, our roles will be richer. And then the other kind of vision is that, by the way, this is doom and gloom, it's going to be centralization and then we are going to outsource some of the operations and actually then we are going to op uh, automate some and then we are going to just have a lot of layoffs. Exactly the same situation, both companies actually doing the very same thing in that the other company actually there's a great kind of positive expectation, even though also hard stuff to be done. And in the other one it's very gloomy and, and people are kind of thinking what is the future in this company. Uh, I've been having my co own companies and leading people for 30 years and, and if I try to summarize what I've learned about leadership. I think that the essence for me is to make people grow. Meaning they start from somewhere and they should be growing each and every day. And, and that's exactly the same for a working community. So there should be a, some kind of growth mindset. And if you take that back to creativity, I think that it's almost the same. Because for me, the essence of creativity is will and skill to improve. So this is where we are at the moment and this is where we want to be in one month or one year and so on. So growing or improving, that's the essence. And then when I'm kind of like trying to see is that how should I lead people or manage people or help people, it all comes back to this meaning, does this help them to grow? Does this help them to be more creative? Does this help them to be more brilliant? And then for example, making them sleep, does it help? Definitely a lot. So I'm trying to manage the sleep of the people, which is an interesting thing. We are discussing is that don't work during the night unless you are an exception, sleep. And when you are talking about remote working places or, or kind, kind of like doing remote work, for me it all comes down to the, the basic simplicity of does it help them grow? Does it improve the clarity? Does it improve the brilliance? And if it doesn't, I would like to keep them on the same place. And if you're kind of like thinking about being creative, doing workshops and so on, quite often it's easier if many people are on the same place. At the same time, if there's changes of rhythm, meaning is that they work better in, in different locations and so on, then I would say yes. But I'm always trying to manage energy, brilliance, clarity rather than people. And in a rather holistic way. Yep, sounds perfect. Uh, I'm going to press you a little bit, though. Uh, I'm going to press you a bit onwards at the same thing. Because the one thing we know is that I was uh, attending a Citra seminar on lifelong learning. And there's very interesting, very interesting talks from different professors from different fields and walks. And one person raised is that when we talk about lifelong learning, one of the reasons why we all have to think about this changing nature of work on the societal, organizational, and individual level um, is that it's often like this. It's a room full of very educated people 
talking amongst themselves, saying that, yes, yes, let's inspire each other. Yes, let's sleep more. Um, that's how we're going to be. But then he posed the question that when we need to talk about lifelong learning, it's really lifelong learning of doing in all kinds of work. And then we're talking about very, because right now our, our talk has been very much around expert work and white collar work. But do you have any insights, views, ideas, suggestions of what we do with the sort of not, you know, the blue collar work, the more sort of um, the work that's changing in a different way? Because there, from the, and now I'm, I'm kind of pushing the perspective of lifelong learning, that how do we turn the mindset of everyone? that there is really no job left that you could not not think about that this job will change. So rather than thinking that my job will go away, how do we get everyone to think, okay, how do I do my job, the part that machine doesn't do? How can I be better at that? And there, this came really explicit to me because we were thinking about um, um, a sort of internet-based um, teaching program. And then we were sort of came to realize that what we're competing with much like the AI for dummies thing that is going on there for Reactor, is that we're competing with, with things like Netflix. Like, why would someone who's not into education, has not been educating themselves for tens and twenties of years, why would they choose our future skills for future work over a latest Netflix series? Because so, this is the thing that's going to hit us in a societal level. We need to solve this one way or another. Yeah, there are, of course, a lot of perspectives in this one as well. And maybe one thing just to start with, that there are studies which say that you, you have different perspectives on your work. And, and, and kind of the lowest level is that it's just a job. And, and, and basically, then you come work just to get money, and something inspiring is happening outside the work. And, and very often, blue-collar kind of perspective is this one. Then you have those who see it as a career, so that, okay, I can develop and I can grow. And, and, and normally there you start to have intrinsic motivation in place. And then there are even people who see, who see it as a calling, like kind of a purpose. Then they, they call it calling and that in that paper. But purpose is kind of the same thing. That is really great purpose in, in my work. So if you have this first one, this blue collar uh, example, so I, I give you an example that what it, it means that, okay, of course you need to have motivation if you want to really do something totally different. But in one factory, what, what was the situation was, that, okay, now they are going to have these new great robots and, and they still need to have operators. The challenge is that now the robot providers are coming from Switzerland and, and, and these other countries and there's customer services in English. And what if something goes wrong with the robot the operator needs to call to that service number and, and, those, and, and, and they need to speak English. So actually they have realized that their biggest skill gap for the operators is not that one that they can't operate these robots, but actually it's that that they can't speak English. So, so these kind of things that it might be quite surprising even that, that, that you have a motivation issue, but then you might have a just kind of basic skill and you can learn English still. And, and, but they, that's a great issue for them. I have t uh, two comments. Uh, first of all, I've been fascinated about the language of chains or the semantics. And I think that, that we are undervaluing the, the, the significance of words we are using. For example, if you are discussing about making change happen in education, I think that we should not be using words that are creating opposition. So, for example, if we are saying is that schools need to change, mm -hmm. teachers hate it and for a good reason. Mm -hmm. But if you are saying is that it's great that we can be improving education daily, no one can be against that one. Mm -hmm. And if you are talking about lifelong learning, and, and what we are saying, like you said, like we all say, is that you have to be learning new skills. And no one wants to be kind of like, oh great, I have to be learning and, and so on. We should be excited that, that there's a lot of possibilities in life. So instead of saying you have to be learning, I would say is that it's going to be okay. You can learn things and you'll manage. And it's kind of like different kind of mindset. So I would love to change the language we are using. using. And that's why many people in OECD, they are saying is that instead of saying lifelong, you have to life, do lifelong learning, you have to kind of like maintain the capacity to 
to do new things. That's one thing. Then another thing is that I think that you started with a spot-on analysis of, of using the language or the kind of like thinking methods of industrial revolution and so on. But that's the way we are organizing our events. So for example, if I'm analyzing this event, this is industrial model event. We are having panel, we are saying something and you are listening and half of you are falling asleep and so on, as you should, because it's a traditional panel. And this is not about the future of work. So I think that we should explode the way we are doing panels as well. That's just small, small thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what, what I want this one. Uh, what I wanted to say is that, that uh, if we are talking about the coronavirus and, and the impact it has on the uh, Chinese economy as such and the people, I've been thinking that they will be going ahead in, in, in cleaning because their houses are being cleaned, they, they clean their airplanes, they will be uh, far ahead of that. Then also in terms of uh, making foodstuffs, everybody stays uh, at home for uh, multiple hours. The, the, they will be uh, interested in cooking and, and uh, definitely we will see some, some master chefs coming from China in the, in the very short term future. So the competitive environment in terms of the coronavirus will be changing a lot and that I would like you to maybe reflect on your answers and in your specific fields. How do you see that? changing the, the, the work. Maybe to still continue from, from this and then... then with the with as Yeah, yeah. So, still continuing on top of things dis discussed here, something that is also on the rise is is inclusive leadership and inclusive work culture. And many of you, many of you have probably heard of of the term psychological safety, and maybe about the the famous uh, research project by Google, where they were searching for two years, like what are the most important factors uh, common in all of their highest performing teams. And what they also found out a bit to their surprise as well was that common in all of their highest performing teams at Google was uh, psychological safety. And psychological safety is a hugely important part of inclusivity. And inclusive leadership and work culture just means that everyone in the team, in the workplace, feels that they're being equally heard and seen and treated fairly. And this is actually, according to research as well, much more difficult than we might even guess how to be, how to be inclusive. Because we are all also, as humans, we are really biased. We have conscious and unconscious biases. We are categorizing information um, just to navigate this, this world full of information. And we build unconscious stereotypes in, in our heads. And that's why, that's why also learning about our unconscious and conscious biases and these sort of topics really also help to be more inclusive. And also it makes sense in these kind of topics as well to think about do we have the right people who have experienced these sort of uh, things there themselves in life? Do we have them in the room? Do, do we have them in the meetings and are, are we hearing the, the right people? I, I think that this is a extremely valuable comment and I fully, fully, fully agree with everything Katya said. 
is that psychological safety, if you want to be creative, if you want to be brilliant, that's where it comes down to. If you don't have that one, you're, you are kind of like losing the edge immediately. And for example, in our work environment, we are working on that daily. We are, we are doing different kind of exercises. We are discussing with people. We are trying to create the sense of, sense of safety. safety. And, and when we are talking about remote work, I would strongly question kind of like if someone says that you can create a lot of psychological safety through Zoom or Skype or whatever, I would question that one. I think that the psychological safety starts with face-to-face -face meetings and so on. And if you are talking about uncertain world where you have to be reacting, you have to be brilliant, you have to understand differences between people and so on, if you don't have that one, I think that it will be difficult. I think for the psychological safety, that's one of our measures in our, our study and then we are also having other cultural elements and it seems to us based on the study that what really correlates with all the good stuff psychological safety definitely from climate point of view you can think about whether it's mastery climate i.e. that we are improving kind of it's a bit this growth mindset kind of thing that we are improving rather than proving which is this competitive performance climate uh, we can see that actually this is mastery climate which clearly correlates with all the good stuff not the competitive performance climate and think now your HR pros, etc., whether they drive mastery and an improvement or competition and performance, kind of competitive performance, I'm better than my team member, uh, a colleague there. And third one was this fairness. So the fair policies seem to be really, really important. And it's very much so here in the Finnish and a Nordic setup. So that if we feel that we are not treated fairly, that there's this justice somehow in, in, in place, people are actually reacting very negatively. So how to create this, in what this positive environment of psychological safety, mastery and fairness is key here. Okay, so how do we do that? <laughs> how do we create psychological safety? Katja wants to... And how do we create the mastery climate? How do we lead people towards this inclusive brilliance and make sure they sleep? If we now stick back to the, to the export workers. Yeah, so there might often be gaps in uh, between the leadership and the other employee base. And really the only, only uh, way to know how the company in total is really doing in psychological safety or inclusivity is actually to, to, to do the research or the audit or something around this where uh, all the employees can anonymously uh, actually uh, share their feelings uh, and, and talk about these matters. So that's why there's, for example, external uh, companies who are conducting this, this sort of audits to companies. And I've, I've heard uh, of several of these kind of, this kind of projects. And there's been, in, in this project, there's been uh, really like the companies have been surprised about the, the learning. So there has been uh, challenges or problems with inclusivity inside the company without the leadership knowing about this. So I think that these are difficult topics and, and often the leadership might not have the view uh, into this without something like this. Yeah, I think interesting there is that when we connect this to biases, what Katja was talking about, so clearly this is because this is a perception game. We need to remember that one. All, all of us know that we are sometimes in a situation that we just don't understand why this person kind of says like that or thinks like that. And it's kind of, kind of the perceptions are sometimes very far from each other. And we have, for instance, we have this LMX measure, which is leader member exchange, which basically measures what is my, as an employee, perception of what kind of relationship I have with my manager, who could be now Herta here. And then I have that perception. Then Herta is basically also rating there in the, in the study that, okay, how CC is that, how creative I am, how effective I am, and what is my helping behavior. And to our great astonishment is that the biggest kind of, if you think about predictor of that one, that Herta is seeing me as a kind of, a, that I ha I'm creative, I'm effective, and as well as I'm, I'm kind of having a helping behavior, is that I rate her as a kind of that we have a great relationship. So this is this kind of self-fulfilling kind of virtuous cycle where biases are working that way that, okay, now I feel that I'm kind of trusted, I have a great relationship, you see that, okay, I'm more connected, committed, and then you kind of 
we are fulfilling that prophecy that I'm going to do great. What I saw at Nokia, which was basically one of my greatest um, kind of revelations, one of those, I had many of them. I was the HR head of Nokia, and I was really basically following all our executives all the time. So 200 executives, and we did this kind of executive reviews, and I followed that, how managers rated, who are the potential ones, and, and we even had external people doing the audits and, and, and kind of assessing. And then we did it, and, and I got kind of a name list that these are the guys who have really the greatest potential in our kind of company, and, 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 and then, okay, these are kind of maybe not, and, and, and then I had a manager change, so that the executive changed on top of these guys, and a certain part. And next round, they were totally different people who had potential, who, who were the highest performers. And I realized that, I mean, this is really scary, how much it is really about chemistry and, and kind of the perceptions, the biases of the leader. And, and basically then, based on that one, promotions, salary increases, kind of everything follows. And this kind of that, this inner core versus who are really inside the team, it's, it is actually quite scary when you start to look at those kind of data. <coughs> My answer is, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that the answer is actually really simple. And, and I, I would say is that you have to be a good human being. That, that's for me the essence. And, and like mentioned, I've been working with education for six, seven years and, and visiting a lot of events. And if I would have to pinpoint one comment that changed my life, it was in, in one, uh, th there was a teacher, th there were two teachers in a panel. And, and one said is that th the question was, what is the role of a teacher? And then one teacher said is that the main role is to inspire kids. And, and, and kind of like all of the audience and everyone were nodding and saying is that, yeah, that's the point. And then the, the other teacher said, no, that's the wrong way. And she said is that the point is that it's enough if he is inspired. So the key role of the teacher is that he or she has to be inspired of the kids and everything follows. So if I'm thinking about creating a psychological safety, I think that the key thing is to be genuinely interested. If you want to be a good husband, be interested about your wife. Don't fake. Same goes for parents and same goes for leaders. And, and so so in, in, in theory, this is simple. But in practice, it's difficult to be interested in your employees because you are stressed, anxiety, and so on and so on. So I, when I'm say, saying that I'm really interested in your opinions, I'm working hard in being really inspired and, and so on, because they can immediately tell if I'm not listening, if I'm faking. And I think that this is kind of like the essence, and it's really complicated, we all know. Yeah, I love that answer. I love all of your answers and I have to comment on that, that we did a study on well, well-being at work in different sectors and there's one thing that was combining all the different sectors, everyone from a hotel cleaner to a finance banker. It was basically that their well-being at work was really, it came down to this experience of being seen at work. And I think it's interesting and it basically meant that their immediate supervisor saw them who they were as a people as people but i think it's interesting that we still like to talk about work as if we were some kind of neutral agents that come here and then when you lead you lead this bunch of neutral agents that you move around like a little plastic men army and <laughs> that doesn't really happen anywhere yet that's what you hear in a lot of the management talk and people are talking in terms of the industrial stick and the carrot and now we move them and and, and, and inspiring people is like, be inspired. And why aren't they inspired? Uh, and I think that there's a lot that comes down to this simple, be real, be interested, but it's hard. I think good people managers all say that that's one of the hardest things in the world. Now, Katya, you have something, and then we have a few more topics, final topics. Yeah, one, one dynamic there is just that we, because when we think about how do we talk to our employees, our team members, we tend to talk about the performance, that okay, there's something now that needs to be done, and, and there's something that is, there's uh, now some kind of problem, we problem solve together, we focus on the task a lot. Then when we ask the employees, that okay, what do you kind of, when you rate your manager, what do you rate? 
no one is saying that, okay, basically we are achieving kind of the value creation target or kind of the revenue target or profitability target. Someone is saying that I, I value that my leader is a visionary person. But actually what most people are talking about, they're talking about what kind of person you are and what is your style, how do you behave. But when we talk with our employees, we don't talk about how great you are and kind of how we like you and, and your personality and, and your style. And, and we don't actually give them this, this at all. And, and, but they, how they rate us is actually about that. Yeah, and I think uh, what Juha was talking about biases was uh, hugely, hugely important because we kind of just go on and, and think that we're, we're treating people always equally. Because I, I'm sure we all love to believe that we do rational decisions at work and we recruit the best people. But due to our biases, that's not really easy. And there's a lot of interesting different kind of studies. One from the world of entrepreneurship was a study done uh, in Sweden and published at Harvard Business Review that uh, researched how investors were evaluating entrepreneurs. And when the entrepreneur was a male, uh, he was see, seen as uh, young but potential. And when it was a woman, uh, she was seen as young but inexperienced. The, the same uh, kind of profiles of, of people. So we sometimes, uh, due to stereotypes and due to our biases, even when we're trying to evaluate people and the potential, we might just confuse performance and personality and this sort of topics. So that's why it's also... And now it gets even scarier because now we have artificial intelligence that we can teach all our biases to and then we can be surprised why it doesn't do the job correctly since we feed, fed in the correct data. So I think this is where a lot of the dangers lie. But great comments again. But I would like to ask you a question about something that's been on the news all week this week, mainly time, working time. There are two examples in Helsinki region. There is an advertising agency and another consultancy, both thinking about how to limit working time. One is trying to create a shorter working week, another one a shorter working day. Now, do you think it's fruitful to talk about time? Is time really an important factor anymore when it comes to expert work? Should we blow up time? Like Saku said, we should blow up this panel. We will in a minute. <laughs> and we'll open it up to you. And then we'll think of a new way of keeping this event. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, I mean, what do, we, what do we think about time? Because how do we measure work is, is the essence of this question, right? Expert work. Then there's obviously work that's more time bound. It is still, by the way, that way that if we go to it, the Nordic countries, we are living in our own balloon, in a bubble. Because if you go to almost any other country, it is still that way that employees don't leave office before the manager has left. And, and this time is still really, really key. But I think about this six hours day, which has been now in the news, and now they are testing it kind of for three months. We know that there's a Hawthorne effect. First of all, that when you kind of get that focus on it, basically for three months it doesn't tell you anything because you should have a long-term effect and it should be kind of a new normal. Otherwise people are just kind of, of course, making it work and they're excited about this opportunity and they are going to be productive. My forecast is that they're going to be very productive during this three, three months time. But I think that it wouldn't tell anything scientifically whether they are truly productive, if that would be better. But of course, in essence, I don't think time is the right measure. In our study, we see that actually we are also measuring how many uh, hours you work. And we see that those who, people who are very excited about their job, actually they work many hours. And, and, and in that way they are very happy about it. And, and, and how can we limit time artificially if people are excited about their job? I don't think it's even that possible. I mean, that's, time is not a key thing here anymore. I think that uh, kind of, I think it's important to do this kind of experiments and, and learn. That's how we learn learn more. Uh, I don't think we have all the all the answers, but something I think that personally seems to be important for for many people now that we more of us at least uh, 
I see more and more people also using Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp and these sort of uh, messaging tools for work. So it's much more difficult to actually leave, leave work. So I think in that sense, it's time is, is really important because we need to also to take care of our well-being and to live mindful lives. We need to be able to disconnect from work and somehow track like are we having the, the free time? Are we having the mindful time when we're, we're kind of out of the work so that we can rest and then, then get back to work and be kind of efficient and well performing? Just a short comment, I agree totally with that one. And we have actually, we see that mental recovery is key and there are four elements wh what you need to have. Kind of this detachment is key, really key that you're able to detach from your work, that you're able to have a relax, that you're able to learn actually is there, and then that you're able to feel that you're in control. And in that perspective, I would fully agree that time is really essential. Uh, l lucky, luckily in my life at the moment, I don't have to worry about big companies or different work cultures and so on because I understand that they are full of people who make everything complicated and so on. Luckily, I can concentrate on my own life and our own company. And, and it's obvious that it's, it's about results, it's not about time. We should not be having that kind of discussion anymore because that's so obvious. And, and what, what we've been doing in our company is that we don't have any, we have only minimum amount of vacations. So people have to be out at least six weeks. But if they want to be eight or 10 or 15, be my guest. If they want to be having three day work weeks, fine. And so on. It's all about results and so on. So we, I think that this f five days, four, we, four, four days, I think that if it's leading into great results, fantastic. If it's leading into bad results, bad. Because it's not about time, it's about results. And what we are doing is that it's all about there's a meaning, there's a direction, there's a vision. We try to employ great people and we want to keep them healthy, sane and happy. And they can decide. They know what is the right amount of work. They know what's expected of them. E exactly. And also, like Katja said, is that we have to be kind of like paying more attention on them not working too much. That's kind of like a bigger risk than the other side. So we can, yeah, yeah. and because that's, that's what is happening when you hire, when you hire great people who are ambitious and you have a company which has a meaning, they want to be working a lot. And what we are trying to say is that don't work on the weekends, sleep more, have a long vacation. If you want to see your family coming abroad, go there and so on. We don't care as long as you are doing great work. Yeah, it's the same in our all of our research data. It's all over. Nobody's worried about people working too little. Everybody's working worried that their people are working too much. So the same dilemma is everywhere. Well, we're about to finish this industrial panel, but before that, we have, I love that because that's one thing that we criticize. Our our data is full of industrial management tactics, and it, it should be something else. And now we organize an industrial panel. But that's what happens. Mindsets stick with us, and it's, they're hard to change, and they're slow to change. And I think I want to finish by pushing you a little bit one more time, and then we open the floor for questions. But if you now have to give an advice of how to be a leader, manager, whatever one you want to choose, or worker in this present environment, and what to do in terms of this opening your mindset to the change, then what would you... What's your advice? Everyone can take home that would be this piece of advice, different piece of advice from all of you. There has been already some good advice here peppering this conversation, but just to sort of sum it up, to give a little takeaway present. So something that's happening uh, in all of the big international uh, companies, huge tech companies and so forth. Uh, and I, my prediction is that like, the importance of these topics is all the time just becoming increasingly important. So my suggestion uh, to start preparing for the future, future of work is that every organization hosts trainings about basics of diversity and inclusion. So we learn what those terms matter and how those are tied to the, the workplace as those are becoming more and more important part of working life all the time. In addition to that, 
uh, it's uh, important to track the, the diversity and inclusivity of the work culture and also uh, host trainings uh, about uh, biases, even though that is doing, uh, by research, that is doing no change for the company culture, but we need to learn more about these topics. Uh, and one thing that is uh, really interesting is that there's already so much research data and best practices about diversity and inclusion, and it's su surprising how much uh, knowledge there are. And this is touching on like the whole, whole organization, because there's best practices for leadership, work culture, product development, recruiting, uh, marketing communications, and so forth, and it touches on every employee. So it's a bigger world than I thought a few years back. I think people are nowadays, or in companies, what we are really thinking about is quite a lot now we talk about employee experience. So customer experience has been there quite a long time and now we talk about employee experience and they are of course linked. And employee experience is a lot about okay, how do we lead, what is the culture of the organization, how do we work together, what are the HR practices, and it's always the perception of the employee in the end. What we know, and I think this is the point what I want to make, is that we as leaders, we are the role models, and actually if we start to behave differently tomorrow. If we think about our own biases and we think about, okay, how should we change? And if I start to behave differently, it's highly likely that people in my organization start to behave differently as well. So the fastest way is to really think a bit, kind of do this kind of within uh, reflection and then think about that how I can change something and then maybe even discuss with the team because that's always good that we kind of agree that I basically, they agree with me about what I think maybe I should change. And if we are able to role model the new behaviors, then it's going to happen a lot faster, the whole change. Uh, I would love to say many things, but I, I say only two kind of like advice. I hate to give advice, but first of all, be excited. Be excited about life. We live in a fantastic life with a lot of potential. Be excited and let it show. That's number one. And then the number two is don't take yourself too seriously and, and don't take your work too seriously because even if it's meaningful, it's only work. Great. I think that was great pieces of advice for everyone, for life in general. And I kind of was thinking that nobody suggests that sort of, uh, did you read that piece of news of the American um, CEO who dropped his own salary to the minimum wage and up to all everybody else's to the minimum of 70,000 a year and there was nothing but good results like basically he tripled his <laughs> his his, uh, his turnover and I think that the, what was interesting was the same thing that happens when you talk about time and changing time is that the initial comments were really negative that's never gonna work so fight the that's never gonna work and think outside the box with this great advice that you've just been given by these great experts. Now, fight the silence from your part and ask questions from the panel. They're here for that. Uh, hand up, who wants to start? And I think, let's start with the corona question. So reflect on the, you, can, you guys can just... Uh, could, could you summarize the question? Because it was about Corona. But I what, what think it was the impact of Corona in the longer run and um, the, 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 the fact that people were forced to stay home and cook. And what's, what we're going to basically, what the impact of Corona is for the future work. That's how I understood it. Maybe she, maybe she wants to. Well, uh, what, what I wanted to say back was that you, you were saying about the security and, and uh, I think it was S Group in Finland who provided the personnel with uh, some, some kind of uh, psychological uh, resources and they, uh, they improved performances due to that. So, so, so they were, in a sense, improving the, the personnel's uh, security. And uh, when, when we are now talking about security, we are at the university premises. And, and as I said uh, about talk, talking about on these microphones, I've, I've normally uh, have not wanted, wanted to talk on a microphone because I, I think they are a big threat in, in terms of how they are dis being disinfected because normally they are not disinfected at all. 
and 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 but but for the panelists i wanted to uh, reflect them in their own uh, personal businesses how how they see it because uh, i think the whole coronavirus is changing the whole uh, competitive environment china is now performing extreme measures in cleaning the air uh, the uh, air flights are uh, carriers are cleaned uh, 36 hours every time they come back uh, so, so, so the standards are improving, and 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 as I see, it is such a huge, big market, China itself. That that that, or or are we able to live here in the West and not bother ourselves in in terms of all the all the big changes that are coming within? Uh, also, the Juvascula uh, city has uh, invested in these uh, clean rooms uh, w which they provide for their doctors which which provide like 99 uh, percent yeah they reflect because you're, you're bringing huge issues here we need to be merciful to our panel so maybe if you react to the corona changing the business and maybe changing what what you see that might be happening mm -hmm. Well, it, I think it shows pretty well why universal healthcare and, and taking care of, care of all, all the people matters. And I think when you were talking about the S group, um, think I, I think they were providing maybe like mental health services for people and, and employees were able to have those maybe for, for free. I don't, I don't remember correctly, but then there was a link to to a better performance or, or something something like this so so healthcare and and mental health and these kind of things things matter for society and business yeah i think this is just my reflection is that coronavirus is basically from human basic needs point of view it's a physical need that you have got health and and, and safety and and if you lose it actually then many other things are, are very questionable, I mean, and whether you focus on it. So I would just kind of, that we don't always remember, maybe this is reminding us that in the end of the day, we, our kind of health and, and safety, and those are really key needs for us, for all of us. Well, I, I, I don't want to be kind of like too light about Corona because it, it can be serious. But I think that for me, it's m more than a reminder of that there might be a virus that that's affecting to all of us is that it's a good reminder that we don't know anything we don't know a shit about the future if we are honest we think that we know that ai will take 72% of the jobs of the lawyers because because accenture made a panel and so on and and you know we can come up maybe it's 72 maybe it's 85 maybe it's 16 because it affects something. So I think that we should understand is that it's an uncertain future and, and uncertain things will happen. This is not, th we might all die of the corona or we might survive. There's a possibility and there might be another virus coming in two years and so on. Even if we are washing our hands and living in a clean room, we might still die for something else because that's a possibility. And I'd say that the only certain thing is that we all will die and it happens quite soon, most likely, meaning in the long kind of like if you're putting things into the perspective. And all our companies will go to bankruptcy. So kind of like these are the things we have to keep in mind and so on. So I am kind of like worried, but I think that there will happen unexpected things. And that's the way the life works. And it makes it exciting as well. Lauri Nairinen, Metropolia ammattikorkeakoulusta. Kiitos hyvästä keskustelusta. Sä kysyit, että mikä voisi olla mindsetin suomalainen vastineen, niin olisiko mielen maisema mitään? Ei. Saku sanoi, että joo. Mielen maisema kivihiilikaivoksessa on toisenlainen kuin tuota puistossa. Should we do it in Finnish or in English? Uh, it's a difficult task, but I think that Mielenmaisema is one of the best translations actually 
what I've heard. And I've been a big fan of Carol Dweck's work for, for 15, 20 years. I met her several times and we've been discussing about... Also, there's an interesting term which is a fake growth mindset, which is kind of like being positive without no reason, or kind of like forcing the positivity and so on, which is crucial as well. But I think that that fixed mindset, growth mindset, I think that it is miel and maisema. It, it can be a... On a personal level, it can be a family level, it can be on a company level, it can be on a country level. But in many companies, there is a certain kind of miel and maisema. It's not as good as mindset, but it's not without value. No, 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 I agree. There's another question. Yeah, hello, I'm Christina Mäkelä from Aalto. I actually don't have a question, but I do have a comment, uh, and that goes to Saku. Uh, you said, and, and I, it was fascinating, thank you so much. Um, you said that when you reflected back on your work life that nothing's really changed. And that started me thinking that why do you say that? And I actually realized when you then explained how you lead, is that you've lived the future work for quite a much longer time than the rest of us. Because what you've been doing, it's highly unusual, first of all. Uh, well, first of all, I've been having my own company, so I have not exactly. been working in a big company. But I would say is that I have not been a perfect leader, but I think that the basic values have been exactly the same from day one. So for me, the essence is, for, when I started the company, I wrote two things in my in my notebook, which I hate notebooks, but but that that but I was still using notebooks. 30 years ago, but I wrote two things is that if you want to be a good leader, you have to identify great people and you have to manage them well. Mm. And, and then it's kind of like going back and I think that it was spot on and, and I've been learning more about how do you motivate people, how do you keep, keep them sane, how do you keep increase the brilliance, but I think that the essential things have been exactly the same from day one. I think that I've been improving in some senses, but I think that the fundamentals are exactly the same. And you might be using Zoom or you might be using Evernote and so on, but the fundamentals are the same. Wonderful. And I must continue because the three leadership principles that you share, they actually do have names. And they are precisely the leadership principles or practices that have been associated with uh, working well I with the you know, future work. The first one is mastery uh, culture, which is driving development and learning rather than achievement and competition. That's, that was the first one you mentioned. Then the second one has, is actually called servant leadership. And, and that is when you think about traditional leadership, you, you so, you're so the mindset there uh, is that uh, your subordinates or your team is for you. To, uh, you know, to deliver what, what your goals are. And servant leadership is the other way around. You are there for your team. And that was the second principle that, that you described. And the third one is, is the focus on holistic well-being that Juha talks about a lot as well. And, and that's about, it's no longer work-life balance, it's just life. Mikko Kosonen, ex Citra, now it's Aalto. Uh, I also found something what Saku said fascinating, and I would like you to elaborate it a little bit. I even wrote it down. You said earlier that I'm managing energy and creativity rather than people. Can you elaborate that a little bit? Because I think there's a deep truth in that. You are not really managing individuals, but energy and creativity. Maybe it goes back to the time and, and results. So I'm trying to manage results as well. And, 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 and I try to identify what is leading into good results, what is leading into excitement and, and so on. So I always try to concentrate on that one. And, and if we are doing something and I have a feeling that actually the level of energy, the level of excitement is going down, then I must be doing something wrong. And if, if there's, we might be going into the wrong places with a lot of energy and excitement, and that's great as well. 
because that's kind of like you go there and you find out something. So I'm not worried about making mistakes, going into the r wrong direction if there's excitement, if people are kind of like, because that's the way the learning happens. So I'm kind of like trying to, I'd say more than trying to manage energy, I'm trying to manage a collective energy so that there's a sense of growth, sense of excitement, sense of motivation, sense of energy in the room and in the company. And I think that that's kind of like for me the key thing in management. And I, I think there's... Exactly. And, and, and I think that you all know that if there's a group of, let's say, 10 people, 15 people, 20 people, one person can make a significant effect on both sides. So if you have a p person who is sort of like bringing the energy down and so on, he can be disagreeing, he can be complicated, he can be difficult, and that's fine. But if he's bringing the, or he, she's been bringing the energy down, then I'm worried because you can disagree and being kind of like with full of energy, and I'm ha happy with those people. But I'm kind of like seeing, okay, this person is not bringing extremely good results and so on, but the energy she's bringing to the community, to the group and so on, I'm excited. So for me, it's all about collective energy in the room. I'm closer. Kia Emeleu Sand, thank you for the excellent comments so far. Uh, you mentioned that you do daily exercises on uh, on building up or bringing uh, psychological safety. Could you give a few examples of the good ones? And then also, uh, how do you measure and track in a bigger organization the uh, sort of KPIs for diversity and inclusion. Uh, yeah, so diversity that is very, very difficult. There's a lot of bunch of different kind of diversity. There's demographic diversity that can be so many different aspects from age to culture to nationality to gender to so many, so many different demo demographic diversity. Then there's also experiential diversity. We all have different sort of exper experiences based on where we have been living, what kind of people we have been hanging out with and so forth. And then there's also cognitive diversity. So I think this is what makes it difficult because it's not really possible to build a perfect kind of formula uh, about this topic and measure it. But if we look at the, and then also because diff in different countries we have different kind of demographics uh, but it makes sense to sort of take into account the local environment and see if there's any sort of diversity depth or uh, if, if it doesn't match. Uh, for example, uh, it might be that if you're a technology company and you have no, no women or no minorities, it might not be even about the, the non-existence of those people because it might already be, there might be some sort of structural barriers that are preventing them uh, from even applying. You might have narrow, narrow personal networks and so forth. So it's really context-based how you should measure diversity. Uh, and also in terms of inclusivity or psychological safety, uh, for that there needs to be uh, I think external uh, kind of company or someone who does the the audit, so the data is like secure and people can give out feedback uh, and trust that uh, it can be given anonymously. I think for if you think about first um, diversity, sometimes it's easy easier to think what is similar. So that if you think that, okay, what is really kind of in our team, what is really our bias in a way that we tend to be all men engineers, for instance, okay. Okay, then it's quite easy to say, that, okay, what we might be missing so that in a bigger scheme of things to kind of keep it in a higher level. But I agree that then the second question is, are we inclusive? Because if you are basically recruiting diversity as an example, or you're building a team where you have a high diversity 
it doesn't mean that you have inclusiveness in that team, which comes to this psychological safety. Uh, do we have this great spirit in the team and everyone can say their opinion? Can we really utilize the diversity? If you don't have inclusivity, actually, then it's all vain and you just create this bad team where someone is just kind of very poisonous, maybe even. But that's not enough either, because then there's this cohesion. So this is this unity of the team is also very key. And this is actually paradoxically sometimes it's optimization game. So that if you have huge diversity, you might not have any unity in the team, any cohesion, and then you don't get anything done either. So where is the balance that you have can have them all? Diversity, inclusion, as well as cohesion. I think, Mikko, in your book, you discussed a lot about leadership unity for instance, in the top team, and it's a key thing that you might be missing it. So if you just add diversity in it and you don't even have a leadership unity yet, so actually you just can create a bigger problem. So concrete examples. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you two and, and you might be disappointed because they are obvious, but I think that they are valuable. First of all is that when we are having, in, in all, all the companies we are having, when we are having a weekly meeting, we are starting with, with, with kind of like check-ins. So people have to, on the scale one to five, they have to say how happy they are. And, and it, it means that, that, for example, some person can say that I'm two because I've been having really difficult time with my wife. And then someone says is that we, we had to cancel our trip to, to uh, because of the coronavirus, so it's three minus or whatever. And, and once people are open and they are explaining what is happening for them also outside of the work, it's kind of like creating a feeling that, yeah, we all have problems and so on. And it's kind of like surprisingly effective. For Finns, it feels odd. But, but even Finns can kind of like get over it and be excited and so on. And, and actually, actually even stubborn guys who said is that I hate this, and, and then you are asking from them after six months is that, do you want to stop this? And no, no, it's valuable. And it is valuable. But another example which is quite obvious is that let's have a Friday lunch with the team. And we are having Friday lunch with the team and we are asking always at the team one question, what do you do during the weekend? And then people are explaining what they do. And all of these small things are creating psychological safety because you are excited about the people you are working with. And that's for me the essence. And there is also uh, <laughs> a... Co Sorry, to, yeah. A quick yeah. Yeah. So two, two points. There's... <laughs> So there's, there's a different kind of traits identified with inclusive leadership. Uh, going to share two of those here. So, so uh, one of those six, six traits, for example, in this one study was the, f uh, the first one was uh, the leader's commitment to visible commitment to diversity and inclusion and having that on their personal agenda as well. And another trait was leader's awareness uh, about his or her own biases and being really also open for for feedback and and hearing kind of also uh, disagreeing or different kind of uh, opinions from from team members but there's a ton of different things how to advance inclusivity okay my comment is that there's a kind of a situation in my kind of leadership kind of journey when I was I inherited a team of 30 people and it was really bad in bad shape I mean the spirit was not what Zach was talking about it here and, and I, I thought as a young leader I don't know what to do and the only thing what I thought that okay what I can do is that basically I gave them every one of them kind of uh, kind of empty paper A4 and I asked them that, okay now rate how you feel from one to five one is really bad at this all shit and then five is it's just I'm so inspired and great to be at work and then I said that, okay then after that one right there one sentence what sucks but write it in a way that I can I can read it loud out I'm, I'm going to do it then I did that one and we were kind of two honestly so that was two I have never seen that before so and then I just read loud what they said and then I repeated this weekly now weekly meetings for two months in, I didn't do anything else to kind of fix those issues, what they said. The whole team self-managed it, and actually it was more than four after two months. Okay, um, 
quick, Saku, very quick. Yeah, quick. And then I'm going to sum up and you can move all of this conversation into the wine yeah, lobby. Quick comment, because what, what I find really valuable is people are, for example, giving on the scale one, because you're doing it weekly. They might be saying is that 4.5. And then you're asking why. And they say is that because I was able to solve this one and this one and, and the whole team is excited and last week was difficult. So you kind of like get a feeling is that what is happening with the team in real time. And, and, and if people have the courage to say is that not happy or happy, then you have a feeling is that you have the safety you are looking for. Okay. I don't know if I've ever got better advice from anyone anywhere, so I'm surprised if you don't feel like Hopefully. that. I'm going to sum up now quickly what you have to remember. Park this in the backs of your head, like Christine always says. So be a good human. Think about your biases, because you have them, even if you think you don't. Think about life, not work and life. Think outside the box, even when people say that it's never going to work. Then true, try anyway. Try, try. It might be hard. Do rather than think, overthink. And uh, what was the last one? I don't know. It might go wrong, but it's still better to try than not try anything at all. And be excited. Yeah, be inspired about everything, because it's exciting and inspiring to be able to sit around and talk about things like that for almost two hours. And now move over there, don't go home. Take a glass of wine and continue the conversation with these inspiring people and give them a good hand.